Every visionary has a story to tell. These stories educate and inspire us all. You could hear them cranking up in the morning and hear the click, click, click of the roller coaster. It's really feeling satisfied and feeling gratified with bringing happiness to young children, especially families. Working with people who are having a good time is so much better than any other job. Join us as we learn from these trailblazers. I grew up in Anaheim, California, or nearby in Santa Ana, within bike riding for a kid. And during those formulative years where audiometronics and submarine rides and the first tubular steel roller coaster, the Matterhorn, came into being, uh, Disneyland was essentially my backyard. Anytime I could get enough money, which in those days was maybe two or three dollars, uh, I would go out there and, and really bond with that park, figuring I would get a job there as soon as I could, uh, which I did at 17 while I was going to college. And I uh, flip-flopped around in my majors. I started in architecture, moved to landscape and urban planning, and then ended up in theater design. And I think it's funny because when I look at what I do now, I think in the, in the world of Disney, we use architecture in a landscaped environment to tell theatrical stories. So all three of those things, even though they were random and kind of chaotic, uh, ended up being exactly what I needed as tools to do uh, what I do even better. So uh, after I graduated from uh, Long Beach State with a theater uh, design degree, I uh, approached Disney uh, about getting in there. I thought it was probably unrealistic so I had a teaching credential in my back pocket almost. Uh, I was about two courses shy. When you were 17 and a half, Disney didn't hire till 18, so I looked within the park to some of the leasees. And it was a good decision because uh, about a month after I hired with the Carnation Ice Cream Company, they were bought out by Disneyland. And uh, as part of the deal, everybody that was on staff at Carnation was carried over as a permanent employee on, on Disneyland payroll. So most young people spend, spend two or three years in a, in a part-time or a seasonal role. And I was within one month of being hired at 17 and a half, I was already a permanent Disney employee. The view of Walt Disney and Imagineering that we saw on TV, that it was a one-man band, that he had a lot of support, but that Walt was clearly the driver of all the ideas and everything, and, and to a good degree that was true. And so the thought of it going on wasn't a, uh, a guaranteed thing. And I, I remember it took me about three months to get back into gear with, am I going to keep going with this dream you know, career thing that I conjured up for myself that may not exist anymore? And I think when they opened the Carousel of Progress for General Electric at Disneyland, and Progress City, which was a huge model, uh, was part of it upstairs, and that was originally clearly Epcot, and it had been renamed Progress City. And so there was a awareness, maybe the dream isn't going to happen, you know. And, uh, and that, was, that was kind of reinforcement that maybe the whole Disney thing is going to be uh, a company that deals in reissuing its current product, but doesn't continue the growth thing. But um, it was announced that we are going forward with that Tomorrowland and we've got the pirate ride opening and um, the Florida project was very quickly announced as uh, viable and, and going to happen. And so I did continue on and, and I finally did get my uh, uh, opportunity to go up there. It was a couple years after Walt's passing though. Um, and I think in those two years I gained a sense of 
this company is going to even grow bigger than it than it was during Wall's time. And I saw my my role might be inspiring them with the cool new ideas that could be emotional and, and engaging to people. And they were real accepting of um, that input because I think they missed it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was something that um, Walt had given them. I mean, Walt never really designed a thing. You know, it was, it was everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so I started figuring, okay, I was a child who drank it all in, as were the people that came along shortly after me. And so we knew what it was like to go to a Disney theme park as a guest and be enchanted or frightened by or impressed by these attractions. Uh, whereas Mark and Claude and the rest, um, they were adults when they created that. And so they, they took Walt's word for it that it would have the right effect and everything. But I don't think they ever um, could enjoy them the same way that uh, a, you know, a child sees, doesn't see how it was done. I started up there in 1970, which put me into the group that was ultimately sent down here to, you know, in the last year in 71 to open Disney World, uh, which became my trip to, to Florida was probably my first major airplane flight. And uh, certainly the first time I lived on my own, I was 22, 23, and I was uh, uh, put in a role of assisting uh, Dave Burkhart, who is a little more senior than me, and we both work for Claude on the 20,000 Leagues attraction. And then as I gained my footing on it, and I was definitely nervous. I figured I'd be sent home in three weeks. Um, thank you very much. And so I was taking pictures like crazy, figuring I'd never be down here for the opening. Um, but I learned pretty quick that if I could pick up a trowel or a brush and show these people who are maybe twice my age, something that was, you know, very intriguing for them or something they hadn't known how to do, then um, they would respect you even if you were younger. And so once I got over that and, and, and got dirty, as, as a lot of people refer to it, um, you know, the trades were, you know, you, you were just one of them, you know. So that was a, a terrific learning experience and I think it's also something to this day, there's almost a transformation for employees that have been in the field and come back than if you're just working in isolation in the design phase. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like you've been granted a, a higher status. It doesn't come with more money, but they, you'll hear again and again, well, he's been in the field, he knows how to handle these problems. And uh, there were a lot of them. I remember uh, once I was pretty secure on the submarine ride, they started saying, well, can you handle Snow White? And can you look in the Mr. Toad ride? And, I was called when they first got the sets installed on Mr. Toad, and they said, there's a problem there, we can't quite figure it out. You know, can you go in there and give us some thoughts on what might, might need to be done? And I went in there and I walked through, and um, the Snow White ride was done by Claude, and he was a master at, at, like I said, space, and so he knew how to fade out all of the architecture and the uh, landscape and everything before you got up into the rafters. And I went into the toad ride and I kept going back and forth and it suddenly dawned on me they'd painted the entire ride when you were outdoors, in, you're indoors, but when you were supposed mm -hmm. to be outdoors, they'd painted it with a blue wall in daylight, which went up to the 12 foot level and then was sliced off at the top of the paintings. And the world doesn't look that way. The world has a, a, a dome over us, if you will, of sky. And so I thought, well, how would we correct that? And I realized we needed to paint everything that was outdoors as though it was lit by uh, street lighting and everything uplit instead of lit from the sky and take out all the blue sky. So I came into the office and here again, I'm 22, 23, and I said, well, I think I've got the solution, but you're not gonna wanna hear it. I said, all the outdoor sets have to be repainted to look like they were taken at night so we can lose the wall and we can take all the trees and instead of them going up with all their beautiful leaves and then whoosh, we can start painting them out as they get further and further away from the, the light sources. So I think that um, I gained again a lot of credibility like wow he saved us you know on that and it you know we did a lot of the work ourselves. At night uh, Leota Toombs who was the lady in the crystal ball and I would go in there with our storybooks that's all the reference we had were Disney golden books and things <laughs> that we could buy in local stores the park wasn't even open and uh, 
and we would you know we would repaint that and uh, and we had a couple of good assistants that were learning and I think in the end it was a it was a, a feather in my cap because you know you suddenly were regarded as one of those people you can go to and he'll maybe have a fix for it that gets us out of a problem Once I got back to the California after the opening, of course, there was a massive reduction in the staff. Uh, so I thought, well, I'm going to bury myself in a project that maybe could be there for the day that the gamble in my mind was, if it does do well, and I thought it would, um, then I'll have something you know, to show off that could possibly go. So I started working on what would become Big Thunder Mountain, and it was the outgrowth of a major Mark Davis initiative that was called Thunder Mesa that was going over on the western side. Maybe I could take that idea of a out of control mining train ride and develop it into something for that space out there in Frontierland. So I did a little model of it and they liked that and uh, they said we'll do a couple sketches, do some sketches of what you'd see on it if you went inside. And uh, I did and then the irony of all of it was the, d the need became more pressing at Disneyland for a Big Thunder than it was in World. And then the space program happened uh, during all of that and, and uh, you know, getting to the moon in 69 continued to be a, a thrust of that period and so uh, it became a question, do we want to do you know, kind of a, a wild out of control ride about space or a wild out of control ride about the American West and space went out. So both of the Big Thunders went onto the shelf and uh, we went into rapid production first here at World with the, you know, the first Space Mountain. And then we followed that a year later in California with the, the, its sister. And uh, it wasn't until those were out of the way and up and successful that um, Big Thunder, which is the first project I was able to follow from inception all the way to the field. Mm -hmm. Um, we had the Matterhorn, which was the first of its kind of a tubular coaster in America or anywhere, I believe. It, Walton it would never market anything like that. It wasn't like, come and see the first tubular steel roller coaster. It was always come to Disneyland to ride a bobsled down the icy slopes of the Matterhorn. Uh, so, you know, technology was always just a way of amazing people in more unique ways rather than something to brag about and I, I try to in, infuse that into people's thinking today but it's really hard to not fall in love with all the technical gimmicks and put them on stage. The Matterhorn was very very successful in California and that was it and then when we had you know now we went in with Space Mountain which had been on the books since Walt's days uh, in the 1965 Tencennial of Disneyland there was a publication in the LA Times that showed amazing Herbie Ryman sketches of this thing called Space Mountain. And Walt was still alive and he said this will be open in the next year or so. And it was always clearly designed to be a rocket ride through space. So that one was on the books. It's, it's just that with the momentum of Florida and getting this park open, it kind of went on the back burner. And I think the, the difference between the Disney thrill rides and the majority of the other ones is much of the thrill is in the story and in the, the scenery and the way in which we uh, drive you through open spaces and tight spaces and whatnot. I never heard anyone say that this is the first tubular roller coaster, mm -hmm. the Matterhorn. Um, I never heard uh, all this, this stereophonic sound and things that were in Fantasia. It was Fantasound. It wasn't like, look at the speakers. I remember when Cinerama came out, they go, now let's stop and show you where all the speakers are in this theater, and isn't this amazing? Um, Walt just used it as a way of making the experience richer, you know, and so I, I think, you know, when they become intrusive, like if we give you a cell phone that activates scenes in a ride, uh, which could be done, I find that that's going to take me out of the experience. And I'll give a nod here to something I saw over at the Harry Potter attraction where I needed a locker to store my goods while I rode their wild ride. You touch a magic mirror and it obviously reads your fingerprint and a glowing locker opens up over here. You put the thing in, close it, come back from the ride, touch the mirror again and the locker opens. 
Now that's right out of the story of Harry Potter. That's something that she could, Jay Rowling could have written. And I'm sure there's amazing technology in it, but it's, it's been disguised as a magic trick in, mm -hmm. in Hogwarts. And so I think that is the way technology needs to be thought. If you extract it and put big spotlights on it, look, we have a high-tech thing and you can interact with it, the novelty of that will wear off right away. I was called by Marty Scalara and he said, well, would you be ready to come back for another Epcot Pavilion? And uh, he said, this time it's Kodak and they don't want the Seas Pavilion, which was still waiting for uh, someone to come along and, and want to be a sponsor of it. Um, and so you need to go up to Rochester and, and try and figure out where their heads are at. And we did, and the word that kept coming out of it was, well, we want something that's really imaginative, and we see Kodak as an imaginative company. And we came back and we thought, you know, you couldn't deal with energy or space or transportation or uh, communication if you didn't have this human quality of imagination that's allowed us to visualize all those things. So we went to them with the concept of doing a pavilion on imagination. And uh, that became one of the most, I think, joyful elements of my career because in the process we created two new characters, the Dreamfinder who is all knowledge and knowing, um, and his sidekick that he creates in front of the audience called Pigment, uh, made out of tiny wings and eyes big and yellow and horns of a steer <laughs> and a lovable fellow, the Sherman Brothers. This is where I met Richard and Robert Sherman, who had done Small World and Mary Poppins and the Tiki Room. And when we had this delightful little story, I knew that it, it just screamed out to have their type of music to accompany it. So it was a chance to get to meet, you know, two of your childhood idols, you know, and work with them. And again, it turned out they, they were like, uh, made me feel like peer uh, instead of like, the, they, had, they had Academy Awards and all this stuff, but they got very, very excited about bringing Figment's story to life in a song. And I went to Richard and Robert and I said, so here's what we've tried on uh, everything from housewives, baking birthday cakes to nuclear scientists. And they all come back with, yes, they gather input and they store it and they recombine it, gather, store, recombine. And they went away and came back with the song One Little Spark. And that's been, you know, uh, a mainstay at Epcot since opening day. So here we were in the late 70s, going into the file of all the things Walt left for us for the last time. Mm -hmm. And it was the most powerful thing that he had left. He wanted to improve both city life and uh, make people feel better about the future. And uh, so there was, there was this drive about it that made you feel like we are about to embark on something that is really going to be extraordinary. And the, there was also a tremendous support for it. Um, Walt had said on the films, we can't do it alone, that we have to have American industry. And here were all these companies that were coming on board, you know, the, the General Motors and the Kodaks and the Kraft and, and AT&T and whatnot. So it was, Gosh, we're right in the middle of this thing. And I mean, flying to these companies, going to NASA, going to Washington, um, it was something that Disneyland was, you know, for making people happy and, and fun and all that. But all of a sudden now, there was this big responsibility. And yet I knew the reason why the task was on Disney to do it is because the secret to all of this is entertainment. Michael and Eisner and Frank Wells came over. Michael brought his son, Breck Eisner, who's today a producer, and uh, said, you know, I personally don't know that much about the business of themed entertainment, but my son goes to all the parks. And uh, so I brought him to evaluate what you guys have. And I thought, great, my career mm -hmm. depends on uh, Breck's impression of my attraction. So I thought I'd start with Star Wars and how we create star tours. Uh, because I figured every 13-year-old, you know, has got to be nuts over the Star Wars universe. And so I got finished with it, and I'm waiting, and he says, Dad, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And Michael says, okay, we're doing it. What's next? <laughs> and then I thought, well, now, Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox are not going to be that exciting to a 13-year-old who doesn't even know what the movies are. 
So I started concentrating on the biggest dip ever done in a Disney park and the steepest down incline. And there's a secret dip do drop in the back of the ride and whatnot. And, um, and then I looked and, and Brett Breck said, Dad, that's even better than the Star Tours attraction. So Michael then said, okay, so will these be open like in a year or two years if we start now? And then of course, all the management people looked and said, oh, you know, these, this maybe five years and three years and all that. And here is the frustration of a film guy that expects projects overnight, you know. And he looked at Frank and he said, all right, get Coppola, get Michael Jackson, get Lucas, and we'll do something in film and we'll get it down to the park in like a year. And that was how Captain EO happened. So bang, we got Captain EO in in about 18 months and we had Star Tours in two and a half years and Splash Mountain by 1989. So I had gone from, you know, this, point where we didn't know whether there was a future for Imagineering to more work than I could handle to get me to the end of the 80s and um, we opened Splash Mountain in the fall of 89 so that was pretty much um, took me up to probably the most challenging and, and most interesting assignment which was Disneyland Paris. You know, and Michael had a pretty good ego and everything. He said, I want our park to be even more beautiful and spectacular than um, anything w Walt did or anyone has done after that. It's, if we're doing it for the fourth time, it really needs to be the most beautiful one that's ever been done. And um, we agreed with that because, you know, we have a park here in Orlando. We have one in, in Anaheim, but I don't think any of our guests go to Orlando or go to Anaheim because they're not distinguished as cities that are um, basis of tourism other than for the attractions that are there. But Paris is probably one of the foremost destinations of tourism uh, anywhere in the world and it's renowned for its culture and its art and everything. So the fact that it had to be the most beautiful Disney park was a foregone conclusion in our minds. But being the businessman that, the, that he was, he said, and it can't cost any more than we spend in Disneyland, in Tokyo Disneyland. So the challenge was spending better. And I think for me, every aspect of that park, we, we analyzed where the dollars would do the most good from a guest standpoint. So for instance, Tokyo, the whole main street is covered. And that's because the, the culture over there is very pro shopping and they must take home many, many gifts for all their relatives and everything. That's not the case in, in Paris. You know, it's not a big deal. Tour, uh, uh, souvenirs is, is sort of a secondary thing. But they love the limited amount of great weather that they do get, and that's why the sidewalk uh, cafe culture, I think, exists in Paris. That you know everybody eats out in the streets unless it's absolutely miserable weather, then they move inside. So we observed that. We said we have got to, for their benefit, keep it open, but provide some way of, of uh, giving covered, uh, you know, coverage during bad weather. So we came up with arcades, which were very European on the back end of Main Street. The savings was about two thirds the cost of covering the whole thing a la Tokyo. And then knowing that there's galleries Lafayette and Printemps and all of the great shopping things right in the city that people go to, we were able to take the money that we saved from covering Main Street and Eddie Sato, who was the director on that, just plowed in the gorgeous detail on that Main Street. It is absolutely stunning. So we couldn't copy the way uh, Magic Kingdom Castle is made up of the lo uh, many of the parts from Loire Valley uh, authentic castles. Disneyland is Neuschwanstein in Germany. So we had to go back to the drawing boards and create a, a total fantasy. And I thought, well, one way to distinguish it would be to put a dragon in the, in the basement. So literally in the caves below the castle, we have a dragon down there. Now, again, we had no money for a dragon, so we shrunk the size of the castle so it's not as big as Disney World, but it's more charming and more beautiful, and it's got a dragon in the basement. Mm -hmm.